Greetings, here again to update you on the major stories of the week. I am Elisa Jade Natasha and Joanne Babazi. Also in today's interview, we will have our guest share her journey as a breast cancer survivor. U.S. deports genocide fugitive Rurangwa. The United States on Thursday, October 7th, deported Oswad Lulangwa, alias Oswad Lukemye, who was the leader of Interdahamwe militia in the Jesus neighborhood of Chigali during the 1994 genocide against the Tusi. Lulangwa's genocide charges include murder as a crime against humanity and complicity to commit genocide. Faustin Nkusi, the spokesperson of the National Public Prosecution Authority, told reporters that Rurangwa was provided with a random lawyer. According to Nkusi, Rurangwa was taken to Majela Jere prison where he will serve his 30-year sentence. But he has the right to appeal. The release of the national examination results. From the results released on Monday, October 4th, out of all pupils who set for the primary national examinations, 82.5% passed, while 105,008 students passed their O-level examinations. Seven out of top 10 best performers in the ordinary level national examinations were girls. Overall, girls had the highest pass rate compared to boys. Among the candidates, 27 boys were from Nyagatere Juvenile Prison, 23 candidates were PLOE candidates and 15 of them passed in the very first division, while the rest were in the second division. All the four candidates in all level were in the very first division. Students from boarding schools started heading to their respective schools on Friday, October 80th, ahead of the academic year that is due to start Monday. Senior 1 and Senior 4 students who recently got the results of their national examinations will start on October 18th. This is going to be the very first academic year to start in October following changes by the Ministry of Education. Rwandan models shine at Paris Fashion Week. Last week, on October 2nd, five Rwandan models from a local modeling agency, We Best Models, were in Paris for Paris Fashion Week SS22 where they presented the latest collections by famous international fashion designers. Christine Munezero, Morella Isheja, Inez Pamela, Onela Omutoni, and Jennifer Jirukweshaka are the models that took a lead at the fashion show's runway that was held from September 27th to October 5th. They also showcased designs at Milan Fashion Week SS22. Randa loses to Uganda in World Cup qualifiers. On Thursday evening, Randa lost to Uganda cranes at Kigali Stadium. The Uganda lone goal was scored by striker Farid Bayo in the 41st minute after Amavubi centre-back Abdul Gwatubdai failed to clear the ball. Randa came closest to scoring through Sky Paharun and Yonzima, but his efforts, one in each half, went wide. The result left them at the bottom of Group E with a single point after three matches. Two Rwandan hotels voted among the best in the world. One and only gorilla's nest in Masanze, a Nyungo forest reserve in Yamashiki, have been ranked among the world's top 50 resorts in 2021 by the US magazine Conde Nast Traveler. According to the magazine, the hotels were ranked 25th and 26th on the list respectively. Condé Nest Traveller is a luxury and lifestyle magazine published by Condé Nest. The 34th annual research for 2021 list released on Tuesday was created based on reader reviews. The survey also comes after Rwanda was named among the top African countries that have vaccinated above 10% of its population by the World Health Organization. Welcome to the second segment of our review, the interview. October is the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Today I am with Philippa Kibugu, the queer, a breast cancer survivor and the founder of Breast Cancer Initiative East Africa. Welcome, Philippa. Thank you. So tell us, who is Philippa and what is your breast cancer story? Philippa is known in Rwanda as the Pink Lady, Auntie Pink, Miss Pink, 
and I am Philippa Kibugu Dikwi, a breast cancer survivor, a wife, a mother, even a grandmother, a retired educator in the U.S. with uh, 28 years of classroom, elementary and secondary, retired because I had to take up teaching older people, not older actually, adult about breast cancer. I am a breast cancer survivor, yes, as you said, and a passionate advocate. Philippa is living to pass on all the information, all the skills, and all the tricks and tips about living with breast cancer. My goal is to see, before I die, reduction or elimination of breast cancer, and maybe finding the cure. We've been fighting for so many years, all around the world. So much research has been done. It's about time we find the answer to breast cancer. What is your story? Having breast cancer, the journey, how was it? Breast cancer was introduced to our family by our elder sister, Mabel, who had it first. Mabel lived in uh, Rumumbashi, in a country where there was no oncologist, no cancer services, no awareness we are in October. And when she got her illness, and it got w worse, even herself, she didn't even know what uh, breast cancer was as a disease. She was airlifted to a London hospital when the cancer had metastasized. It had moved from the breast to the liver. To cut the story short, she did not survive. My sister Faith and her husband Roger were taking care of her prior to my coming from California to come and help taking care of her. She died while I was there. And I had to carry her body from London to Lumumbashi. That is the story or the experience that changed my life completely. Can you imagine having your sister in cargo of the plane you're sitting in and you in a passenger seat for more than 20 hours? I don't wish it for anybody, but it did happen. Now, I'm not going to tell you the whole story about funeral and all that. I'm going to jump and to my return to U.S. When I returned to U.S., the land where awareness, support group, breast cancer groups, so much going on in the positive, fighting breast cancer. I embedded myself and engulfed myself in that because I had to do something about this scourge that had taken my sister. And I was afraid and traumatized. What if it happened to me or my sister or the girls in the family? So I learned, I tried to learn everything I could. And be to me, 2000, uh, no, 1994, I got my diagnosis. But unlike my sister, I was informed. I was in a country that everything I needed was there to perhaps cure me. 
and on top of that, I'm a, f I'm a, f uh, I'm a very um, faithful believer in God, and I had strong support from the family to the church to friends and to the medical team. So I survived. And I'm not going to talk about the, the big long story, but I want everybody to know that having breast cancer is not a joke. It's something that completely changes your life. And it's tough. And it is life changing. But it's so funny. I will not change anything that happened to me because of breast cancer. Because as a result of it, I have realized the strengths and the willpower that in each one of us has. And we don't know until something tragic and something traumatic happens. So out of the bad, the good can, can, can happen. So after surviving, instead of, which is funny, instead of uh, languishing into, you know, saying, OK, uh, I have survived. I'm going to enjoy my life. My life was full of really heavy questions. I looked at my sister and I said, would my sister be alive if she was in the US? Then I said, should where somebody live really determine if they live or die? That is the catalyst that made me look at my own life and say, Philippa, God has given you a new lease on your life. You better use it. So I said, I'm going to go find out what's going on in Rwanda. Because during the time after I got well, many uh, African uh, patients would come to Houston where I live, and everybody would tell them, oh, you need to go see Philippa. She went through it. And you know, I started a support uh, immigrant African uh, support group. You know, I, would, I was the contact, the, oh, the, <laughs> the, the, the contact for the, the patients and the survivors. But then I joined one of the biggest uh, African-American uh, uh, breast cancer organization called Sisters Network. And I was there for seven years. And during those seven years, I was learning so much. But at the back of my hand, uh, head, I would say, yes, I'm, I'm going to learn. And one day, I'll go home. And, and in 2000, and, oh, before I did that, I also joined, I left Sisters Network and joined Susan G. Coleman. Susan G. Coleman is the one of the strongest um, breast cancer um, organizations in the US. Very powerful. And they welcomed me. I was on the, uh, on the affiliate in, uh, in, in Houston. I was even on the educational committee where I helped start the youth. Um, it, they called it a Pink Club. And again, I said, OK, one day I'll go to, to Rwanda, and I will start something for the youth. So in 2007, I said, I, w I think I can go to, to Rwanda and see what's going on. But as a teacher, I didn't have money to go. And then as a Christian woman, I said, guess what? I'm going to fundraise, and I'm going to sacrifice all my traditional expensive outfits sell them, and whatever comes out is going to take me to Rwanda. I told four of my best friends, 
and they were it's strategically done. One was a lawyer, another was accountant, another was a, a nurse, and another one was a businesswoman. And I said, shall we go to Rwanda? They said, yes, and we are behind you 100%. We had an, uh, uh, a dinner at my house, big dinner, and we invited special people, and we had an, a silent auction. They helped me decorate the house with my clothes. And one of them was so ambitious. And when I think about her, she's just too much. She says, nothing is going to go, even if it's rugged, it's not, nothing is going to go below $100. Guys, we fundraised, the first fundraiser for Philippa to go to Rwanda, selling her own clothes, and we had uh, uh, fantastic food we all cooked and we raised enough money for my ticket return ticket and some to spend while I was here and I came 2007 2007 when I came oh my god Rwanda was recovering from genocide and I was faced with uh, Incredible, incredible sight. There was no oncologist. There was no uh, services to do with cancer. There was nothing. There was, it was shocking. Somebody coming from a land of milk and honey and you come, you find people, you know, that's when you had uh, people, some of the people had their ears cut, you know. I was dealing with the the trauma from genocide and the trauma from the the women who who had been uh, 27 women I met and uh, one of them is a uh, order who is inside who is a co-founder of this organization the 27 women I met had had all mastectomy mastectomy is when they remove your breasts but it was all one 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 of them they had removed the well breast and left the sick breast. I took her aside and I said, you have to have this one removed. Because of the stigma and the myths and the misinformation surrounding breast cancer at that time, which, by the way, still exists mm -hmm. up to now. Mm -hmm. She told me, she says, thank you for coming and whatever, but I cannot die without a breast. I am telling you, that what, what convinced me to come back to Rwanda, because I realized the extent of ignorance and extent of stigma and extent of misinformation, and I said, I have to come back and teach and see a little bit of what what uh, I, um, I could do from my own experience. I have never regretted that decision I made. I went back, talked to my family. My husband said, oh, go, go. I showed him pictures of, oh, women and stuff, and he said, no, you have to go. But I was still teaching at the time, and I, I taught from, uh, from 2007 until, until uh, 2015. That's when I, uh, I retired. It became too much. The doctor said, look, if you don't... Uh, stop doing the two jobs where you go in summer and then you come back and you have to deal with the young the young ones you're going to be sick so you make a decision are you going to be an activist or are you going to be uh, a teacher I said you know what i think i have taught enough children i think it's better now to go and teach the mothers and the grandmothers and maybe some men because breast cancer also affect men and I have been 
doing that. I registered this organization in the U.S. in 2008. Then I came to Rwanda 2009. That's when I registered it as Breast Cancer Initiative East Africa. And there's a lot that has happened and I have spoken for so long. I think that's enough, a, a little bit about who Philippa is. Thank you. Um, for how long have you been a survivor of breast cancer? 27 years. And that is my tool when I meet women who say, oh, cancer is a, a, a death sentence. It's not a death sentence, but each woman, I want each woman in Rwanda to take charge and know that early detection saves lives. And in order to take, to, to adhere to early detection, you have to be aware. And being aware is knowing what cancer is, what are the signs and symptoms, what are the risk factors? How can I reduce my risk, for, uh, my risk to cancer? How can I, um, how can I um, uh, go to the doctor when I'm sick? All those things. And that's why, although we have October as the Breast Cancer Month, for Philippa, every day, every breath I take is Breast Cancer Day minute because that's how important it is. Why is the fight against breast cancer important to you? Have you ever lost somebody? Yes. Have you ever lost a sister? No. Have you ever lost um, friends? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. My sister was young when she died. She left a five, four-year-old and a 12-year-old. She had so much going for her, but she lived in Africa where there were no sci uh, 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 cancer facilities and resources. And herself, she didn't have any awareness and she didn't know anything about the disease. She died. The disparities in Africa result in premature deaths. That's why it is so important to fight breast cancer. Breast cancer can be cured if found early. So since in Africa, the economic situation doesn't allow us to have the luxuries that I had in the US, which I'm sure one day we're gonna have. Then the best protection, the best defense we have is awareness. And we can, it's achievable, it's, you know, it can be sustainable. So the fight has, has to go on. We have to fight men, women, youth, all of us, so that we pass on the information and we pass on the tools and we fight this disease. What is the role of men in the fight of breast cancer? Hmm. Men, especially spouses, nobody can survive this disease alone. This is not a disease you you go through on your own, although some single women have done that. But on top, of, you know, without even a, a man, there has to be some kind of support. It's not a disease you can, you know, go through alone. Now, a man has to be a man. But I, through my, my experience with uh, being uh, an advocate and having this organization, I have seen disappointing situations because men perceive suffering different from women, some men are not strong enough. And in fact, I'm being nice. It's, I don't know whether it's being 
strong because I have seen men who abandon their wives when they see them go through illness like breast cancer. And we've had so many of them. In fact, as a result of that, we have established a children's foundation, the children orphaned by breast cancer because the man lives, their excuse is she's a damaged good. If you, you know, because of the sexuality and all that, is if she doesn't have a breast, she's no longer good enough for me. Uh, we, we, I have witnessed a man put his wife here in Rwanda, in the front, in a small room, marry somebody else while she's going through. But that's the negative part of it. I have seen some men, and there is one right now. She, she, uh, the, the woman is at uh, Kanombe, and the man takes care of her so, so well. He bathes her. He cries with her, and he he's just incredible. And he has so much hope that she will get better. And I don't know about that. But the, it's two, you know, two sides. So don't be deceived. A man can be the, the other, and uh, they can be a good man. Now, my prayer is that we can have psychosocial uh, support, which I don't have much of it because it's expensive, where we can have families, uh, f uh, f impacted families can have uh, sessions where they know how to deal with pain and money, pain management and suffering and, and uh, um, terminal illnesses and afterlife and things like that. But we don't have it. So we do it with our, with our own uh, amongst ourselves. Mm. Mm. Around that, mm. did your husband support you all through the sickness and survival mode? What do you think? There's no way. Let me, uh, let me put it this way. My husband and the children, not to mention friends and family, were there 100%. And to show you how supportive my husband is. I have been here since 2019. I have not gone home because of this cause and because of COVID. And all the time he's saying, it's OK, I understand. Do what you have to do, because I know if you don't do it, you will not survive. So he really is supportive. and. His son coming to visit me. He has been supportive. Yes. That is nice. Um, breast cancer su surgery mm. is known to cause so much stigma. How do you overcome that? Surgery? You know, losing your... Yeah, losing mm. your breast. Again, is a liberation, you know. Mm. Uh, you know, you have to... T once acceptance, you know, that's another part of this. When you realize that you are Philippa, not breasts, not legs, not face, not hair, not you are Philippa as a, the, the essence of Philippa is in. Mm -hmm. And losing a part of you doesn't take anything much from you it's when you accept yourself. Self-esteem comes and self-acceptance also comes from understanding and knowing who you are and being able to say, hey, this has happened, but life goes on. And again, that's part of awareness, you know, mm -hmm. and getting rid of the myths and the stigma and whatever. You are more, you are more than enough. Mm -hmm. I am more than enough. If I didn't tell you I had a double mastectomy, you would know. I did. And if I can share that, another person say, oh, she's OK. And I'll be okay. Being willing to give a little bit of yourself to add value to another human being, which is what I'm doing, really. It's significant than wanting to be important and sexy and being a, a showpiece. No. There's more to life than 
this body which, by the way, all of us are going to go. One day, we're going to go. Um, how is social media helping, your, helping you with your activism? I would like somebody to donate a social media manager because I try very hard. You can read my uh, Facebook. If I'm on Facebook, it's too hard to go to Twitter or Instagram. Or what is the other one? Oh, I try LinkedIn too. Mm -hmm. But I think it is very, um, you can reach so many people, but I reach a point when I, where I say, am I reaching the people I really want to reach? Who are the people in the village? That's why I actually started a project called Fighting Breast Cancer, One Smartphone Per Village. I get, and I, I have been a bit successful, but I haven't been able to, to do it. That program, I have an app. And then uh, besides the app, I have a guide. Guide is in Kenya, Rwanda, and the app is in English. So I train either a survivor, and recently I wanted to train medical students, but COVID messed us up. So the program goes into the village, and they have all the information, the awareness again, and education. And they teach the village, they, they, they teach the village uh, members where they come from. They know them, they trust them. It's not like Philippa who is a foreigner, they come and say, look at this Muzungu, what is she <laughs> saying? And I'm telling them I'm not a Muzungu. They say, no, 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 you're just a, a black Muzungu. <laughs> so uh, they go into the village and they teach, and they do it during Omoganda. Uh, du during uh, Omogoro mm -hmm. Now, COVID has, excuse me, COVID has stopped all that. We haven't done that. And we had uh, 23 villages, which are now uh, not as functional as are because we, uh, I have to interact with them and I haven't been. Rwanda has almost 15,000 villages. That's another dream. Besides this, this one is going to go faster than. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if a village is roughly 800 and we had a smartphone in each of them? It would be like a fire. Everybody would know about this disease. But money, funding, and finding the manpower to do that and COVID, you know, has put a stop on that. You live in the U.S. as well. What can Rwandan women learn from their counterparts in the U.S. in terms of challenges to do with fighting breast cancer? Well, um, again, because of the social, uh, the economic social differences, there's a big deal between uh, difference between uh, the American woman and the, the Rwandan woman. The Rwandan woman f starts off with no knowledge about the disease. The Africa, the American woman starts off, I'm t do talking about average because there are some who don't either. Mm -hmm. The American has awareness, has access to screening, treatment, insurance, support, you know, a lot going on for her. This woman in, 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 in Rwanda is uh, surviving. Actually, if you look at my, my logo, my logo stands for the African woman who never has time for herself. She's either in the field, taking care of the husband, the children, the animals. By the time she gets home, she's so exhausted. The, Af the American woman has time to go to work, get a job, go to have a gym, eat well. She has choices. So there's, you, we are dealing with the up, apples and oranges. But when it comes to actually suffering from the disease, if we give them a, a, a fair kind of thing, breast cancer is similar. The agony, the ecstasy, the fear, the guilt, 
the trauma, all is the same. But where she differs, again, is the American woman doesn't have uh, uh, taboos and, um, and stigma because, oh, it's a disease, I can go and get checked. She has reminders, uh, a mammogram, you, she, she will have uh, from her insurance or from her doctors, they will call her, oh, it's time for your exam, and she will go. The, uh, the Rwandan woman, she doesn't even know what uh, a mammogram is, mm -hmm. not to mention the disease itself. She's too overwhelmed by disparities, by needs. But the one who knows is going to take care of herself. That's why we have to move her, no matter where she is, to the time, to the place where she has the knowledge. The Rwanda health system is incredible. It's so organized that they have a mituary, I understand. Mm -hmm. The mituary uh, uh, pays for screening. I just found out that the insurance, uh, uh, insurance is here. Those who work in different levels, they get insurance, but many, Afri many, many Rwandan women, I was talking at uh, INM Bank, they don't use uh, free screening. They have to be woken up. Look, get your annual, get your annual uh, screening for whatever it is, whether it's dental, uh, uh, vision, whatever. So there's a lot of you know, differences. But when it comes to the actual uh, going through the experience, I think the similarities are more so than, than uh, the differences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, oh, I wanted to say something about this. Okay, yeah. Yes. Now, another thing that differs from uh, Rwandans, Rwandan women and American women. I don't want to call it generosity, but I think it also comes from lack, need, not having enough, you know, poverty. Because this is um, a prothesis. This is a prothesis, the beginning of this prothesis wha is in the US. It's a knitted prosthesis. A friend of mine who is also a survivor started this. She needed one and somebody made one for her and gave it to her free. When she felt so good, you were talking about body image, she felt so good, she said, I'm going to start making, making sh this them free and so that I can give them free to whoever needs them. She's now so w global. She gives these knitted knockers all over the world free. I went to her and I said, Barbara, can I have some of these? She said, sure. Then she started giving me some. I said, but you know what? I would like you to come to Rwanda and teach a few of my survivors, some of my women, how to make these so we can make them ourselves. She said, absolutely. She came 2016, and she taught 30 women, Rwandan women. And she says, Philippa, I'm going to ask you one thing. Don't commercialize this. I said, Barbara, I'm going to make sure that I don't commercialize your concept. And I have never. Now, it costs 10,000 francs to make these. That is inclusive of the material and the labor. Those women who make them, we have to pay them something. So I have to find the materials to bring and then make them here. My, my uh, wish was I would like to find favor with Rwandans to sponsor this so that we can give, like I've just found out there's a woman here who needs this and she asked me how much and I said this is home, come and get one. I will even give you a bra because when I go home I tell them look I have this, this, this need and they say we'll, we'll meet it. 
I want Rwandans to open their hearts when it comes to economic and health issues. We solve them ourselves so we don't have to go outside. For instance, the silicone prosthesis costs $250, some of them being worn by, you know, the women in higher mm -hmm. uh, economic, social economy. This costs only, two of them cost 10. Surely, there should be somebody who, who can say, we will sponsor 100, 200, so that whenever they are needed at RCC or uh, Siashka or Pfizer, wherever, or I I in the Rwamagana, wherever, they can get them. Made in Rwanda by the three, 30 women. We have even trained people from Kenya how to do this. And now they make them in Kenya. I want people to open their hearts and we own our problems and solve them. It's possible. This is a, a special process that changes a woman's image from being withdrawn, unsure, not confident, to confident and self-assured, and her life goes on like nothing happened before. So for the final part, mm. help us bust these five common myths f about breast cancer. Myth one, breast cancer is contagious or infectious. Breast cancer is a non-communicable disease. It's not contagious. It's not infectious. It is it starts in the cell inside. It's a biological condition. So it's not going to affect you. Myth two. Um, breast conservation surgery is unsafe compared to complete breast removal or mastectomy. Not true. Breast conservation is the latest, uh, one of the latest um, um, treatments. The, uh, the reason they did either complete mastectomy was depending on, you know, because there was no other uh, type of treatment. Like when I came in Rwanda in 2007, that was the only treatment. And by the way, it was being done by doctors who are not trained. They were just general doctors. So, no, conservation uh, is, is, is okay. okay. When it's done by professionally trained uh, doctors. Thank you. Myth uh, three. Breast cancer is not curable. I'm here. 27 years. And I'm not the only one. I forget the statistics in the US, but it's on more than, uh, more than uh, 90 million s survivors right now. So very soon we are going to be able to count in Rwanda. Look, we have some already here. And I'm, I'm, able to, I'm ne not able to tell you exactly how many survivors we have in Rwanda, but I know we have more now than we had in 2007. Myth four, every breast lump is cancerous. No, ma'am. Not every lump is cancerous. No. But everybody should have their lumps um, tested and screened and you know you need to go get the uh, information from your doctor don't keep it and say oh maybe no there is no maybe with the with cancer you have to be assured and there are ways you can do it thank you myth five and the last one men cannot get breast cancer <laughs> Two, uh, we have two deaths of men, uh, and I want to talk to about one who was a, a lawyer. He he found out he had um, a, a nip uh, a pimple when he was 20. 
He died when he was 40, and when he died, he was blind. He had all, all things had happened to him because he didn't want to believe he had breast cancer. But yes, men have breast cancer. The percentage is much lower than women, but they do. As what she said, awareness. Let's keep on spreading the awareness. Prevention first is best because it saves lives. Thank you for watching. For such stories and more, please check our website and our YouTube channel at the New Times Rwanda. Until next time, have a blessed week ahead. Bye.